Joining us now is Ron Diebert. He is the director of the Citizens Lab at the Monk Center for International Studies at the U of T. Welcome back to TVO. Thank you for having me. Let, let us start because I, I suspect everybody who's following this story has heard the country called Burma and Myanmar. Right. Which is more accurate? Well, both are accurate in a sense. It's that uh, the terms are politically contested. The name was changed from Burma to Myanmar after the military coup. So there are those who feel strongly that we should refer to the country as Burma for political reasons, but they're virtually interchangeable. And how do you refer to it in your internet dealings? In the internet dealings, I, I refer to it as Burma, actually. I take a political view on it. Then in we support of do, human rights. We'll do that yeah. here then. Okay. Uh, give us the broad overview of how, because I, I'm sure, uh, you know, I, everybody who's been reading the mainstream media on this always sees the, the place line as always Bangkok. Right. Uh, there's no mainstream media reporting right. going on inside this country. Yeah. The internet is having a huge impact. Yeah. How so? Well, let me say first of all that Burma is one of the most repressive governments when it comes to the media environment in this country. The media is very strictly regulated and controlled. Uh, the research that I've undertaken inside that country going back to 2005 has uh, tested extensively internet connectivity from that country. And uh, this is a country that is a pervasive filter of internet content in just about every category of content that we test. They block access to human rights information, political opposition, foreign media, um, so it's very tightly regulated and controlled. Also, it's one of the lowest countries in terms of ranking of internet penetration. Less than 1% of the population has so, so internet you connectivity. You say all that and it leads one to believe that the internet can't they? have an impact. Well, it did. <laughs> and yeah. this is the, the interesting, wonderful thing is that even in spite of these controls, citizens within the country uh, were still able, in spite of, I, I should say also, internet cafes are the primary way that people gain access to the internet in this country and they're heavily uh, monitored, heavily uh, surveyed by the government and so people are taking great risks to get the information out. How do they do that? How do they bypass the filters? Well, there are a number of ways. Uh, first of all, people can connect through their cell phones. If a cell phone is enabled with something called GPRS, General Packet Radio Service, it can connect to wireless networks, connect to the internet that way, and send out videos of the demonstrations. So a lot of the videos of the demonstrations have come out that way. They can also use proxy servers. There's a software that we created that many people in Burma are using to get around internet censorship. However, there's you know, something over the last few days that we should probably discuss here, and that's the fact that the Burmese government has slowly turned the tap off on the internet. So it's shutting down, and the images that are coming out are trickling out. They've taken a drastic measure. Here. Well, let me take you back. I, I gather the, the, a, a lot of the demonstrating and the protests have been, in part, organized uh, online. Once that happens, how do you keep things going online to make sure that the, right. the pressure continues? Well, I think the interesting thing here is that I'm not sure the protests were organized online, so to speak. A lot of what's coming out of Burma, the, the, the use of the internet in this case, is for foreign consumption. Remember that most of the people in Burma don't have access to the internet. So these are, in my opinion, largely spontaneous demonstrations within the country. However, what's really, I think, remarkable is the extent to which an issue like this is able to gather widespread international support through networks of civil society instantly through uh, blog postings and uploading of videos on YouTube. So most of this is for foreign consumption. The protests themselves are quite spontaneous and of course have been uh, very violently put to a halt now. Well, I was going to follow up with that because we know how the protesters have used the internet to help organize. What about the military? Have right. they used the internet as well to help quell demonstrations? Well, the, f the first thing and most important thing that they've done to quell demonstrations is gradually shut off connectivity to the internet. Now there's some question as to exactly what's going on here. There are four international gateways out of Burma. In other words, the two main internet service providers connect out of the country through uh, China, Japan, Thailand, and Malaysia. And uh, it's a simple matter for the government to cut off uh, those gateways, but at quite a large cost. You're cutting off business, you're cutting off your own communications. Um, so uh, they've taken the step, it seems, to either heavily filter packets going through those networks, which is possible, um, or they've cut off internet access entirely. Our researchers in the country, for example, we have not been able to communicate with since September 29th. So, um, you know, and the way we were communicating with them was over the internet. How many people have you got in there? Uh, 
you, there, I have to be very careful about what I talk about when it comes sure. to security Let's research. Let's not get anybody in trouble, but tell us what you can tell us about how you're getting information there, out. We've worked with uh, three researchers in the past. Uh, there were two that we were working with this year. We were just about to test. And when we test, we send software into these countries, and the, the software is, is operated by our researchers. They connect to the internet uh, service providers and run a series of network mapping tests that essentially lift the lid on the internet and, and tell us what's going on beneath the surface, so to speak. Of course, in a country like Burma, this is a violation of national security. It could get you killed. So when we talk about how many, who, and so forth, um, I always take a step back and pause. Sure. Are these your people, as in Canadians from over here, or are they locals? Uh, no, these are locals. Yeah. Okay. So they're really in, in jeopardy if yeah, they're... Yeah, it's, it's okay. the same case, uh, uh, in, unfortunately, in uh, a lot of countries worldwide where we do the testing that we do. In Uzbekistan, for example, uh, in Kyrgyzstan, in Tunisia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Syria, uh, all around the world. We're testing presently right now in 60 countries. In a lot of those countries, the researchers who undertake the tests are doing so at great personal risk mm -hmm. to themselves. And when you say we, you mean Citizen Lab? Uh, the Citizen Lab is part of the Open Net Initiative project, which is a four-university collaboration, Harvard, Cambridge, Oxford, and the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto, plus about 20 non-governmental organizations worldwide, hmm. about 80 researchers in total. Oh, it's big. You have been here before at this television station talking to us about uh, the use of the Internet as a powerful tool to yeah. move human rights and free speech forward. Yeah. What example would you, or what conclusions do you want to take from how effective it is given what's happening in Burma the last couple of weeks? Well, the interesting thing, I think, is that we used to have this assumption about the internet that it was a powerful force for democratization, liberalization. States cannot compete against this massive force. I don't think that's true any longer. I think uh, what's shown in Burma is that if states are willing to take drastic measures, they can control, to a large extent, the flow of information. But on the other hand, there are ways in which nimble, creative people using technology can get around those filters. So what in effect is happening is whereas in the past we've thought about the internet as this force that's overwhelming everything, now it's become a battleground. It's an object of geopolitical contestation among states and non-state actors alike. And I'm very much a part of that. I'm pushing for a, a certain notion of the internet. I'm pushing for a certain architecture, and governments like Burma are doing the opposite. So it's very much a battle between us as to the future of the Internet. But is the sad reality that if the junta is prepared to kill lots of people, there's not much the Internet can do? Well, you see, there's the, the rub, I think, that even in spite of what's gone on, the message is out. Um, and uh, the blogosphere, the civil society blogosphere, people who are interested in human rights and promoting access to information and freedom of speech online, this is a powerful transnational advocacy organization that is pushing for rules to promote access to information, developing technologies like the one that we've, we've developed at the Citizen Lab. Uh, once, that, once their interest has been triggered and the spotlight is on a country like that, um, it's very, very hard for them to keep going in the direction that they're going.